Ladies and gentlemen, there she is. That is the ex from Oregon. You're not having fires up there, are you? This is Ronnie oh, Bennett. Oh, terrible fires. It's almost as bad as California and Southern Oregon. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought it was. I thought it was just down in California, around Shasta, which is, of course, near well, the border. Well, that's very north, but it's also moved further north. And you must have heard they said this morning that I've forgotten the name of it, but one of the fires is the biggest ever in California. Yeah, yeah. It's awful. It, but it, of course, you know, there's no, there's nothing called, there's no global warming, you know. No, there's no global warming. It's fine. It's cool. Uh, I. Uh, 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 I, I just uh, think that uh, when the Ice Age comes, they're going to say, there's no global warming. Look how cool it is. They did uh, say that a lot. Look at they, those ice. They, the well, they don't cold. understand global warming. It has nothing to do with heat or cold. It has to do with the planet is warming, and therefore it causes effects to happen that will, in many cases, cause freezing. You know, you know I can't just, I'm so worried about the environmental future that maybe we shouldn't talk about that today. <laughs> It's just terrible. Well, what are you worried about the environment? Let me let me be honest. About At least what, I'll die what, before. Well, it's that's what I'm saying. You know, let the next generation figure this out. Let us just have a nice old age. All right. Well. Yeah. Still have to speak up. You still have to speak up. I see. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I guess. Um, you know, but I mean, I, 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 I it, it, the problem is you tune on to all the news networks. And you're thinking the world's coming to an end because they live on the world coming to an end. They live it used on to be crisis. That way. You remember when days would go by and you didn't hear anything about the president? Maybe he turned up in the rose yeah. garden now and yeah, then. Yeah, that was during Obama. <laughs> <And then laughs> that was during that Obama. Nothing. Yeah, that was during <laughs> Obama. You know, you go for a week and not hear about the president. This yeah. one monopolizes the national conversation, but yes. the, but. It's not only that, it's, it's, it's this, what I call, um, you know, I, I remember when I was a kid. Yeah, I do remember when I was a kid, folks. Uh, 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 next door, uh, one night on a rainy night, uh, some guy next door uh, took this woman who he was living with and threw her down 50 <gasps> concrete steps, right? She gets to the bottom, she's battered, okay, obviously. And uh, she's rushed to the hospital to take care of her. And her wounds are attended to. And a few days later, they let her out of the hospital. She's back living with the guy. And I often wondered why that happens. And it's because, you know, you have these dysfunctional relationships. You have these, these uh, this codependency on misery and I feel that there's no difference between that and the press and Trump. But, <laughs> I'm so glad you got there. I was wondering where you were going. <laughs> yeah, but there's no difference between that and Trump. <laughs> you know, that there's a codependency that the press has on having to put up with this guy and give him the publicity he wants. Uh, and, and, and yet, most of the stuff he does isn't even newsworthy. You know, when he goes off to campaign for somebody, you don't have to broadcast the speech. You know, it's that's the same not. Time. It's the it, same speech. It's every not time. important. And when he does some, aren't I wonderful beating my chest? <laughs> and when he does a horrible tweet or something like that, no reason to cover it. So my theory is, stop covering the president in such minutia, and it'll drive him nuts. Yeah, well, they won't because everybody, they're afraid everybody else will, and then everybody will of go to course. those channels. Because I think we are all as addicted as the media. We've been trained that way for two years, two and a half years now. Yeah, oh, I, I know. My, my wife, who says, I hate this. I don't want to watch any of the news. And then and she comes home, and she puts MSNBC and on that. and starts going, that son of a bitch, you know. And I'm going, come on. You know, if, if we just stopped reporting him in such minutia, if we only reported him when he did something important or was something newsworthy that affects you and I, it would drive him fucking nuts. But no, they keep reporting on him. He, you know, he, he's, he controls the press. He talks about the fake uh, news. He controls the fake news. So... I'm through with my little religious. You're through with that. Well, let me tell you something I'm doing. 
I don't know if you know, but for many years, from 2007 to 2015, I had a secondary blog called The Elder Storytelling Place. Mm -hmm. And I didn't write for it. Readers wrote for it, and I just published the pieces. I stopped it in 2015 because I'm getting old and I can't do as much work every day. Um, but recently, one of the best right over, and by the way, over those eight years, we had more than, way more than 2,000 stories, fabulous stories people told. And I can't remember, but several hundred writers. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, one of the best who told the best family stories, her name was Nancy Lights. Um, her, one of her kids emailed and said that she had died. She was 89. And, you know, I don't publish Time Goes By on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I, so I was thinking about Nancy and what wonderful stories she and all the other people told. Mm. I thought, you know, one or two days a week, those two empty ones, yeah. I could post stories, but put them on the blog I've got now and keep it down to one or two. Mm -hmm. So as of today, when I publish, uh, today meaning when viewers are seeing this video. Which is... Yeah. <laughs> which is we're recording it on Tuesday but I will post it for Wednesday yeah um, will I put all the back end necessary together and it will start the storytelling again it'll I'll, I'm announcing the beginning of it today and we'll see how it goes it will be nice and so uh, in anticipation I want to tell you a story about when you and I moved to New York City Oh, okay. Memories. Lots of memories in my mind. <laughs> you see, what we always did, if you will remember all the moves that we made, you went ahead and found a place to live, and I followed driving the car and the cats to the new place. Screaming all the way. Not you, the cats. Well, that's another story. <laughs> and, uh, well, no, what I used to love about traveling with those cats is Yuntiv, who was a female, would scream the entire... 2,000 miles or oh, however long. One time she was pregnant. Oh, my babies, you're killing my babies yeah, the whole way. Yeah, we're, oh, we're all going to die, right? And yeah. meanwhile, Shabbos, who was the older male, uh, the first thing he would do when he got into the car was about within a mile of the trip, take a dump in the back seat. Oh, I thought he threw up. I can't remember. No, he was taking a dump. Oh, okay. Thro throwing up was something he did around the house all the time. He was like I this see. fountain of joy, you know. But anyway, go so, ahead. So you're, yeah. All right. So always I would tell you what I thought kind of apartment or where you should get it. And I had told you, I don't care what you get us in New York City. It has to be in the village. Instead, you bought, got a place in Riverdale so that when I came across the, the, the George Washington Bridge, instead of turning right into Manhattan, <laughs> turned left into South Bronx. So um, we're there and the moving people are coming and we're getting settled. And after a week... Um, I was taking the bus into Manhattan to meet our friend Mary for lunch. If you remember Mary, mm, yeah. who was a model. We knew her from Houston. Right. And she worked in Manhattan in a place across from uh, Saks Fifth Avenue. So I took the bus in. I, I dreamed of being in Manhattan my whole life. Now I'm finally going to set foot on it for the first time ever. And I get out of the bus at 50th and Broadway, and I've never been there, so I'm trying to orient myself. And it's noon, and there's just, you know, what New York and Broadway and fifth, you know, Midtown is like, it just people swirling everywhere at noon. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to or organize myself north, south, east, west, and I hear somebody yelling, sex pervert, sex pervert, sex pervert. And I look around, and some guy is pointing right at me he's wearing a beanie with a propeller mm -hmm. pointing at me and yelling sex pervert sex pervert and i'm terrified i just want out of there people people aren't stopping they keep going but they're turning to look and i don't much like that so i finally figured out what direction i'm supposed to go in to meet mary and he screams it the whole way i finally get across the street and i lost him now little side issue i later found out after we'd lived there a while someone told me he was well known on that corner he'd been doing that for years his name was larry and he was there for years and years whenever i passed by during the day i would see him there so i walk across to where mary and i are going to meet on fifth avenue and i'm a little early and it's at saxis avenue very near that with rockefeller center across the street and the big atlas you know the guy holding up 
the world right. at Rockefeller Center. And I'm watching all the people in New York walking by. At lunchtime, the men all wore suits in those days. This is 19, was it 67, 68 we moved there? Something uh, like 69. that. 69. And uh, so I'm waiting uh, for Mary to meet me there. And people are going by, and two guys are going by talking. One of them grabs my arm and says, are you married? And I kind of stutter. I didn't, nobody ever talked to a stranger, never spoke to me like that before. And I kind of stutter, blah, 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 blah. well, yes, I am. And he turns to his friend as they walk off and says, shit, I'll never be able to find anybody to marry me. And that's when I knew I would be fine in New York. Yeah, that yeah. anything could happen at any time. And if just you know that, you'll be terrific. You'll get along just fine in New York. And yeah, yeah. And you got along well in New York. You, in fact, you have a love. I love yeah. New York. I well, miss it every day. You, as well as myself, had had a love affair with New York. Okay, uh, and, and I I remember that love affair because I find it totally absent in me now. I do not have a love affair with New York. There is nothing. Mm-hmm. There was something about it. I don't know what how I could put it. It to begin with, it was dangerous. You know, it, it was a slight... What do you mean it was dangerous? When was it dangerous? I always felt in New York it was like you were walking on the edge of a razor. You know, that... that, that You're it, living there now. Why are you talking in the past? Because the, the past, that's New York in the past. And I like that New York. I like the dirtier New York. I like the rougher New York. I like the, uh, the, oh, the hint of danger New York. Okay. The New York we've got now is is just so sanitized. You can't believe it. You know, I mean, they're gentrifying Harlem. And you know what Harlem's losing? Harlem! You yeah. know, when I, when I first moved here, I went, you know, there's something about this neighborhood I really like because it's still kind of the New York I used to know. You know, has that kind of edge. It's a land time forgot, you know. And now, forget it. I go up the street. I go one block up the street. It's like I'm anywhere in New York City. I couldn't say I was in Harlem, you know. Except uh, one of my blog readers who lives in Quebec sent me an email this morning with a link to a story about a coffee place restaurant um, on Lafayette Street that's closing after 35 years. And although I was never a regular there, um, it was only five or six blocks from where I lived in New York. And so I would stop in or meet friends there for coffee now and again. And all, and last time I was there, my favorite go-to restaurant when you just want something good to eat but you don't want to go a long way or get too fancy, that had closed after it had been there 35 or 40 years, just a block from where I lived. A lot of that's happened. There's a place off of uh, Houston. Um, I forget the name of it, but it was like Marjorie's favorite place to go get brunch, okay, because they had a great... Uh, 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 a great Bloody Mary, uh, and um, we went there. We this uh, I think we're, our first date was actually there, and we went back you had a to brunch a, date for a first date. Well, we went to a movie and we went to have brunch. Okay, it kind of a it was just a first meeting kind of thing. You know, you you a first date with people. You never make it dinner at night because if you don't like what's going on. Well, you get. I have to be somewhere at five o'clock, right? You know, you have an excuse to get out of it. So the first one is never. Is always something like a brunch or a whatever. Anyway, <laughs> I didn't know that rule. This place, we went by it the other day to say, "Hey, let's go get ourselves something." Around. It's closed after thirty-five years. Yeah. You know, it's just that there are a lot of people who have been here a long time. Very successful restaurant. It's not like. Nobody was dropping by to get food anymore or anything like that. You On a Sunday, you'd have to wait in line to get in there. Uh, but the rents, the you know, all of a sudden the rents come due, and here in New York, they're like just going sky high, and people can't afford to keep the doors open any longer. So all the old established little places you like to go to, you know that restaurant you and I used to go to near where you were, that Italian place? Oh yeah, my uh, it, favorite calamari. I was going to mention yeah, that yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, 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 closed. Ma- closed. Um, closed. Marinella it was called. Yeah, Marinella's closed. 
Yes, I know. I was, when I was in New York last time, I was really, I was going to, I was walking around downtown. I thought, oh, I'll do lunch there and have my glass of wine and my calamari, which was my go-to lunch when I worked from home. Yeah. And it was turned into some kind of pizza place or something. Because they didn't do the calamari that's bread and all of that. It was the fried calamari. Well, not fried no, it calamari. Was, it was well, a, it was a broiled calamari, broiled calamari with a great flavoring on it. Yeah, it was right. the best. And uh, she and I used to go there on occasion, and we went back a couple of weeks ago and said, oh, let's go to there. We haven't been there in a while, and we went by, and it's closed. And you go, yeah. come on, this you place know, was... I think, by the way, though, that some of this lamenting what goes away after, I mean, 35 years is a good run, um, lamenting so many places that you know you once liked and, and it's been over many years i think that's an old person's complaint young people don't even know those places ever existed they have their own that they're going to lament in 25 or 30 years yeah but there was the, the sad part was there was no reason for this place to close down it would did great business it was well just, no i mean what you said before is far more important i think in many cities obviously new york but many others do these days yeah. is that usually in new york for a commercial rental you get a 10-year lease and then it goes up five six ten times the the best bread that i thought in new york city zito's in mm -hmm. my neighborhood yeah. which served lots of italian restaurants um he'd been there for God, 50 60 years um when the lease came due again they increased it five times and he was very old by then he said i can't do this anymore he said i can't work that hard i can't raise the prices that much so he retired and seven years later it was still empty yeah and i think this i don't place, know if it this, still is now this place last been, time i saw it which was seven years after it had closed um it was still empty uh, uh this this uh, uh place we used to go for brunch uh i think it's still empty it's you know nobody's rented it yet so why raise the rates why not just keep the people there yeah, it's it's you know Accountant type people. Uh, we're get, tell I'm me getting that it to sound. Has to I'm, do with I'm, deduction, tax deductions. I'm getting to sound like an old fart when I. When <laughs> yes, I, when I, aren't we all? That's, yeah. It comes with getting old. I think that you're just stuck yeah. with it. You know. You know why does this happen? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's 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 the urban person's version of get off my lawn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, it, it. But it's sad because it would be nice. You know, like I was thinking about this. I just when we were talking about this. You know, this place closes down. 21, which was a speakeasy during Prohibition, mm -hmm. is still mm -hmm. open. Mm -hmm. There are a few. I think, isn't Delmonico's way downtown in the financial district? It's been there for two or 300 years. Maybe, yeah. And it could be. And part of the reason is I think they own the building. Well, see, that was, that was what I had thought about, about the bread place. And it, you know, it was so great to walk by it at night because the ovens were in the basement. Yeah. So when you walked by at night going home, you got the wonderful aroma yeah. of bread baking yeah, as, you, right. as you headed home. But I always wondered, why didn't you just buy the damn building? It must have come up from time to time while you were there for 50 or 60 But years. you know what happens also? Let's say you are, you do own the building, okay? And now, mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden, here come developers saying, hey, this is a nice piece, piece of land. We want to buy it from you so we can build a... 50-story building or something like right, that yeah. and there's enough money in it and you go oh, fuck it why do I have to keep serving sandwiches you know um, in fact what they're doing now we now have these new buildings in New York which I say is the new sky the new skyline of New York which are these what I, I call them pencil buildings mm -hmm. right they yeah. go up they're higher maybe than the Empire State Building Oh, but, well, but the, lots are but, these but, days. But they have a very small footprint. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking, they bought a bodega from somebody. And, <laughs> and then tried to figure <laughs> out a way <laughs> that they could put a building in there. It's a little tiny piece of land way up though. It's exactly <laughs> what they do. You know. So, I mean, uh, but, but you know, that uh, if somebody wants to buy it, you're going to sell. You know, especially if they really, because land here is, you know, it's very expensive. So, oh, well, but, I think the thing is that the way the prices go for anything in New York having to do with real estate is you always could sell it. If you really liked what, you were, what your well, business was, you could still keep doing it. My great love always, and I'm sure probably yours once I mention it, is P.J. Clark's. 
which I used to go it, which is a bar here, but I wasn't one of which, the in crowd, which is so a it one didn't attract me a that one much. A one story building maybe three story building I don't know but it it was a bar and they owned mm -hmm. the building okay and then all mm -hmm. of a sudden somebody wanted to come and build a giant skyscraper right and they wanted to buy PJ Clark's and PJ Clark said fuck you so they literally built the building around P.J. Clark's. You know, I can't swear to this, but I have a sense that downtown in the village that NYU, New York University, did that around the house of some 19th century writer. Um, I can't remember. Oh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Yes. I'm not positive, but I think that's what happened with the place he had once lived. Yeah, and they built built a building around it, the same kind of way. Yeah, yeah. I remember the scene in China. There was this guy who refused to move, and they were literally building this huge. I mean, I don't know. You've never been to Beijing, but the 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 size of the buildings is amazing. Just amazing. I mean, just a footprint. Okay, and they were building the thing around this one guy's little house. It was like this ditch around him. Yeah. On YouTube somewhere, I don't know the name of it to tell you, There's and I don't remember what city, but it's not a U.S. city. It's either Canada or Europe. There's a, a between two buildings, there's like very narrow, like less than yeah. six or seven feet wide. Yeah. And somebody built a house in there, a very, very, yeah. very narrow house, and it's, but vertical. So there's like five stories, and you can stand in the middle of the house and touch each other, either wall. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if in the future they take one of these small little footprints and then put a building up and then as soon as they get higher than the buildings around them, move it out and let it balloon out. Oh, that's out. an interesting idea. By yeah. the air rights, you mean. The, yes. By the air rights, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. But, uh, you know, but the New York that we moved into had a sense of danger. When the subway went by, there was so much graffiti on the trains that it was like this blur of color. I almost enjoyed it in a strange way. There's an old joke about New York that I, I first heard when we first moved there, and I've always loved it. it it's a Q&A. The question is, when was New York really, really great? Just before you got there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I just don't, maybe it's because I'm older and I don't do the nightlife and things like that, but I don't find anything exciting about New York. I just find it big, uh, crowded, um, expensive, uh, what what have you, you know? Uh, I, I, of course, me, I would, because I grew up in the country, I would love to like, you know, live like you do and maybe a little more I've rural I've got an area. idea. What? We'll trade apartments. We trade. We'll trade apartments. You have to discuss that with my wife who refuses to move out of New York City. Well, I understand. I'm with her. You know, she. I'm, I'm so sorry I had to leave. You know, she says, "No, where there's no way we're moving out." I said, "Well, you know." Well, what? if it ever gets to that, I'm sitting here and out my window. There's a few more apartment buildings. They're only two stories high. Lots of trees and grass, and mountains all around you. Yeah. And I would just love to be in Manhattan again. Oh well, you know, we have a guest room, by the way. <laughs> and so do I. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, uh, and and the guest room is this summer is being taken up quite often. So you know, it's uh, it's amazing. So anyway, uh, you're feeling good. Life is. I feel uh, fine. Life is fine. Uh, you yeah. know. Uh, no complaints. Woman's a woman's a survivor. Uh, she not only survived uh, ill health a while back, uh, cancer, but uh, she also survived me, which I think is even a bigger <laughs> uh, a bigger accomplishment. You know. Um, it was okay. Uh, I think that it would have been easier if we'd gotten, if we were old when we met. <laughs> well, you know, if, if, let me put it this way. Marjorie and I look at each other sometimes and just go, so this is what it's come to, huh? <laughs> you know, uh, we never talk divorce because well, it's ridiculous, you know, at this age. You know, when you're young, hey, maybe I got another two wives in me. <laughs> you know? I never thought of it that way. <laughs> yeah, you know, but at our age, you go. Well, at least it, the company's fine, you know. So, it, it, I, you know, what have you? Uh, but uh, you know, it's always a pleasure talking to you, and and it's it as I say, it's so 
nice that we can reminisce about New York City and you told your little story about people yelling at you. Um, <laughs> there were the st there were just one last thing here. There were always the street corner screamers in mm -hmm. New York. We don't have those anymore. Really? No, I haven't come across one. I, long I have to tell you one quick one. I was walking a friend of I think it was my brother's girlfriend back in those days uh, was visiting New York and. I don't think she was staying with me, but we were spending some time, and she'd come to my apartment, and we were walking from my place on Bedford Street to wherever we were going, and we walked by a guy who was begging, who I recognized, and once in a while I gave him money when I went past, but that time we were busy talking, and um, I would, didn't want to hunt for the change or anything, so we just kept going right past him, and then I hear him, yeah, she was very tall and very thin and gorgeous and much younger than I was. And we, so we pass, and then I hear him yell at us, I never met a blonde who didn't have money. <laughs> I love that stuff in New York. There was another time I'm coming out of the subway on a horrible, horrible hot evening, sweaty and just at the worst of that kind of summer day that New York can provide. And we're crowded going up the stairs, and I hear a voice right in my ear saying, would you go to the movies with me? I was probably in my 40s at the time. And I turn around, and there's about a 19-year-old, very good-looking Puerto Rican kid. And I was so shocked. I said, I'm old enough to be your mother. And he said, yeah, but I loves my mama. <laughs> <laughs> I remember once walking down the street. This was on Broadway. And a guy goes, you know, uh, a, a spare change, right? And I just walk by him because that's what you do. You don't engage them. You just walk by. And as I get about five steps away from him he goes you heard me <laughs> see what i miss that stuff in new york so much yeah well if i at least had that i would be happy with new york but i don't we don't have that anymore you know or maybe you don't get out and about as much to see it. that could be anyway ronnie always wonderful talking to you and yes. we'll do this again in a couple of weeks okay all right ladies and gentlemen Take the care. fabulous ronnie oh let's tell them where they can find you timegoesby.net, which is her yes. blog, and it's all about what it's like to get really old. And as of today, we're starting the storytelling again. Okay. Bye-bye, Ronnie. Bye.